Good morning. Good good morning, everybody. Um, uh, Order. <laughs> good morning, everybody. Uh, it's a it's a, a pleasure to uh, welcome uh, Will Rubux uh, today for um, our um, Heas lecture, and um, uh, to uh, uh, he's a professor at the University of Leiden in the Netherlands. Uh, to give you a short. Uh, background information on Will. Uh, he, uh, I think, started his career at the University of Nijmegen, mm -hmm. reading history, if I'm right, and then switched for prehistory to the University of Leiden, um, where um, he uh, stayed for uh, all his career. And um, he's uh, probably known to uh, most of you for his work on uh, Neanderthals, but of course also on his um, review and uh, critical evaluation of the first uh, occupation or first hominin occupation of Europe. Um, anyway, uh, today I think he will talk about uh, Neanderthals. Um, and uh, yeah, welcome again. And uh, it's yours. Thanks for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be in the most livable city of uh, the world, I guess. Huh? Yeah. Yeah, what, I, what I'm, I'll try to do today is to bring back two strands of research that we in our little group in Leiden had over the last one or two decades. One was about, uh, was because I retired a few months ago, officially, I'm still working, of course, but uh, one was about um, the deep history of fire use in, 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 in the Paleolithic. And the other was um, trying to get to grips with the results of a of a of a long lasting huge uh, uh, excavation of last of a last interglacial landscape in uh, in the former german democratic republic Marjolein even participated in those excavations uh, I'll, I'll get back to those excavations later so but the f the fire research um and this uh, excavation together uh, made us wonder about um, the impact that fire use by last interglacial Neanderthals may have had on, on, the, on the landscapes around on the landscapes that we were excavating in the um, between 2004 and 2010. We know from the ethnographic records sorry there's something uh, oops, like this, yeah. We know, of course, obviously, from the ethnographic record that uh, that uh, recent and sub recent hunter gatherers use fire for a wide range of purposes off site. Uh, the on site use is, uh, is very well known and uh, documented, but also in um, elsewhere in the landscape, fire use is a very important tool, as has been documented for, from from in all continents. Uh, this book by Bill Gamage essentially states that when Captain Cook d discovered uh, Australia, he discovered one big parkland that had been uh, modified by uh, Aboriginals using fire for a wide range of purposes and that the whole, that, let's say, that there wasn't any natural environment anymore in uh, in Australia, and that Aboriginals through their fire use had modified that landscape to a high degree. And another illustration is this beautiful picture from uh, John Glover, a convict turned painter in uh, Tasmania. The mills planes that are figured on this painting are nowadays covered in forest, and they were the, the planes were open in the 19th century until the time period when uh, the Aboriginals ceased to exist and 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 be active there, just by by a wide range of, of fire use, and not all of it intentional, but just repetitive small scale fire use. These landscapes were kept open, and, and that interested our working group in Leiden um, because of the fact that we were picking up very strange signals, as I will explain, uh, in the um, in the in the proxies from the last interglacial sites that we were digging in uh, eastern Germany. And in order to 
and in in the paper that we published in nineteen in two thousand and fifteen, so about ten years ago, in current apology, we made something like an inventory of all the available ethnographic data about the character of fire use uh, of offsite fire use and the use of fire in landscapes, and also pointing out the difficulties one encounters when trying to differentiate between anthropogenic and natural fire use, certainly at an at the at, at an offsite scale. So the, the the problem, and I will get back to that, of, of differentiating between anthropogenic and other uh, factors in, in modification of, of landscapes. And I'll start with this case, which is an unambiguous case of anthropogenic modification of landscapes. And that uh, relates to the large scale lignite quarrying that has been going on in uh, in both the Germanies, so Western Germany, but especially former Eastern Germany, uh, and um, that entailed huge ecological problems. As some of these quarries, the ones that are still active now in Western Germany, are 500 meters deep. Uh, so they 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 create ecological disasters in a in a wide area around uh, the quarries. Uh, the biggest one at the moment is something like, I think it's 20,000 hectares large. But we were working when we started this Neumark Nord project together with people from Monrepo in Germany and the, the archaeologists in uh, in Halle, so in the former DDR, GDR. Uh, we worked in a quarry that was only 2,000 hectares large and 125 meters deep. And the good thing about this, uh, about these horrible landscape destruction activities is that in the top parts, in the top parts, Pleistocene exposures, Pleistocene deposits are exposed that contain the traces of uh, uh, Pleistocene human presence on a scale that you that we will never get uh, in other locations beside these huge uh, quarries. So this is a case of uh, discovery through destruction. Um, when this quarry, Neumark North, about 150 kilometers southeast of Berlin, near the town of Halle, um, when quarrying started, there was a very active uh, German archaeology professor uh, Dietrich Mania, who closely followed the the excavations of the top layers covering the lignite. Uh, the, the, these quarries were about lignite, focusing on the brown coal. But Dietrich Mania was focusing on the Pleistocene uh, deposits on top of uh, on top of the lignite. Well, the Pleistocene deposits on top of the of the glacial till that was on top of the of the lignite, and he and his team. From 1985 to 1990, 1995, or so, even a bit later, they recorded more than 30 kilometers, 30 kilometers of sections through uh, a lake that was 25 uh, uh, hectares large. So this huge quarry um, exposed various small-scale lakes and or puddles or whatever, and the biggest lake that Dietrich Mania surveyed was about 25 hectares large. And in that, uh, of that lake, he recorded, as I already mentioned, 30 kilometers of sections. And um, from those sections, a lot of environmental proxies were obtained by him and his colleagues. There was a lot of uh, uh, archaeology. There were skeletons of like like of of this this uh, this this bovid associated with uh, uh, lithic tools. Uh, there were hundreds of cervid remains of Dama Dama fellow deer. He excavated something like uh, seventy skeletons of of of, of forest elephant, Paleoloxodon uh, anticus, uh, and that was only a tiny part of what was probably ever present in those quarry because he did this mostly on his own. Rescue archaeology. He got a phone call from one of the drivers of these huge machines, and then said, "Then they told him, Dietrich, you haven't been Einer, And then he moved in and uh, tried to to rescue what 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 was still available. And this is a picture taken by one of the National Geographic photographers at the end of the uh, at the end of his work there in the somewhere around 1995, uh, uh, trying to record the distribution of a elephant skeleton in Neumark North. But when the quarrying stopped, and with this huge amount of material 
uh, being curated, restored and curated in the in 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 the reserves in of the of the Halle uh, heritage officers. Um, this area had, like many, had a huge had an ecological problem. There was a quarry that was 150 meters, 125 to 150 meters deep, completely polluted, incredibly acid uh, groundwater. Uh, and so this area had to be reclaimed. A lot of reclamation work uh, went on, especially from, let's say, 1998 onward. And in that reclamation work, archaeologists came in. Uh, in the, you, have to, you have to imagine that before the wall came down, hundreds of villages were removed, replaced, displaced, Churches were destroyed. And that is still going on to some degree in Western Germany at the moment. Uh, this is a church, a medieval church in 2007, when we were working in the quarry nearby that uh, has been saved. The church has been moved, uh, uh, moved to another village. But those were exceptions uh, that, that, that um, the, 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 let's say the cultural records was taken into consideration. That was something that happened very strongly after the, the wall came down. And in that reclamation work, of which, um, of which, uh, in which archaeology was an important part, this this is the outline of the original quarry. And in that reclamation work, this this quarry was gradually turned into a huge recreational lake. Uh, uh, and in order to and before that lake became uh, uh, complete, before it was filled up, uh, as, as I said, it was more than 100 meters deep, there was some archaeology that had to be taken care of. This was the site that Norma North one that Dietrich Mania had uh, uh, already um, more or less surveyed, and he discovered a second site, Norma North two, at the edge of the of the lake. The site was going to be submerged, so archaeology had to come in, and that is where uh, where our project started uh, so this is a close-up this is the, the the big lake that was discovered by and analyzed by Dietrich Mania these black lines are areas where he had uh, the possibility to excavate very briefly mostly in many cases only a few days um, the rich archaeological and paleontological record of this lake and this is a tiny lake where uh, our German Dutch uh, cooperation went in and there we had the chance to dig for five years in a row, very detailed, every day people were in the field, um, a small lake uh, over an area of about 500 meters and with a depth, total depth of about 10 meters. So we worked our way through the infill of a small lake uh, to contact, and that helped us to contextualize the data from this other big lake where uh, uh, such, uh, let's say, uh, um, systematic excavation was not possible, but the finds were incredibly much richer from the from the big lake. So this is a, a very schematic cross reaction to this Neumar North uh, uh, sequence. Uh, the lignite is covered by uh, uh, late Sali and Till. That is, let's say, MIS six. Then you have a lake infill, very fine-grained, uh, silty deposits overlain by loss from the last glacial period, from the Wycelian. And this is uh, just a view of uh, of the field work. I don't know whether Mayulain is on there. Um, but so we we gradually worked our way through the infill of this of this tiny lake. And at the background, you can see the artificial lake, the new lake that is filling the the old quarry uh, approaching the site by 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 waters diverted from the from the river Salem. Yeah, we worked there day and uh, not day and night. We worked there almost every day for, for for five years in a row, funded by the people who were also funding the the movement of the church that you saw a few slides ago. So we were to some degree we were greenwashing the lignite uh, exploitation, one could say. On the, on the other hand, we we thought that uh, it, it was a unique chance to, to uh, excavate at a scale that would have been impossible without uh, the, the support of the of the this Mitteldeutsche Braunkohlengesellschaft AG. This is a close-up of the sediments. 
they're incredibly fine grained and laminated. Um, and this is about eight centimeters. So just to give you an, an idea of the of the, the sedimentary environment, a, a very fast uh, deposition by, by, by runoff. So after rain, according to the micromorphology, uh, incredibly rich in, um, like the Neumark North one lake, incredibly rich in, in all kinds of proxies. On the left, you see uh, algae. These are uh, stone words from algae. And here are, uh, uh, they are approximately one millimeter. And there is a, a chart, uh, chart um, organic, other organic remains, uh, shells, etc. A, a very rich environmental record. Uh, many uh, a, a very rich pollen record from the from the infilling of the lake. This is uh, the infill of the lake, so about th in this case seven meters, with well, you know the the, the classical uh, uh, classical pollen diagram with with, with percentages, uh, and also indicated here are charcoal counts where you see a, a huge spike uh, appearing in the in the in the in the geological unit where also the, the first hominin traces appear, both in Neumark Nord 2, so our small little lake, and the big lake uh, of Dietrichmania. Because, well, we invested a lot of time in correlating the sequence from the, from, from the Neumark Nord 2 lake with, the, with the, the bigger one from uh, a few hundred meters further away. Yeah, and the main find horizon uh, about one or two meters above this first spike uh, yielded an enormous amount of uh, archaeological uh, material. We know that it accumulated over over less than 450 years because of the fact that these these different um, pollen assemblage zones, these different vegetation zones, the duration of these vegetation zones are very well known because of the the counting of uh, annual layers. That was done a bit north of Neumark North in, in, in Germany in the 1960s and 1970s. So we can assign, um, we know that, for instance, this 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 uh, pollen assemblage zone three lasted only 350 years. Whereas this pollen assemblage zone five, when hornbeam hornbeam uh, appears and dominates a closed forest environment that lasted about 4,000 years. And so you can immediately see that uh, there's a, a significant, a substantial slowdown of a sedimentation rate, because 4,000 years here are represented by 50 centimeters of sediments, whereas this uh, short time period of a, a three, of, of uh, 350 years uh, also is represented by 50 centimeters. So the, the, the sedimentation rate of that lake goes down dramatically over time. Um, from this 500 square meter excavation, we have more than 20,000 lithics, extremely fresh, um, a bit boring, at least for me, but um, they have been pr pretty well published. Uh, more exciting are the, the huge numbers of uh, bone remains from the, from, from, from the site. Uh, we are at the moment more than uh, 120,000 bone fragments have been recovered from these excavations. Most of, almost all of them smashed to pieces so with anthropogenic breakage. Uh, a wide range of species, mostly mostly consisting of bovids, equids, and cervids, but also some other uh, material. Uh, and again, of those 120,000 fragments, most are coming from a very small area, half of this room, uh, and sometimes they are present in, 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 in pockets uh, which are associated with large pebbles, with pounding uh, traces, and some of those pebbles have been heated, as we know from, from TL studies. So it's a very strange, a very bizarre, extremely rich uh, uh, site in terms of uh, lithics and um, Bone rem photo remains with beautifully preserved cut marks on, on, on the bones. The bones are in generally are in general very well preserved. And we have from this small area, we have an MNI for the main find level, because there are many find levels, of 166. 
So 56 horses, 40 bovets, and a lot of service, and, and a, a lot of heated material. So heated lit dicks, uh, wood, charcoal, charred seats, you name it. And according to the um, studies by Lutz Kindler, the animals were butchered all year round. There's almost a complete absence of carnivore modification. There are a few bones, something like a dozen among these uh, 120,000. And the majority of faunal remains are, as I mentioned, from a very small area only. So very puzzling. It, it suggests, but as I said, this is work in progress, that for whatever reasons, um, carnivores stayed away from those uh, bones and that may have been the case because humans were there all year round, but we don't know. One of the th one of the many things we don't know about this site. What we do know, as I already mentioned in the beginning, is that um, when humans move in, when hominins move in, there's a big spike in in uh, in charcoal in 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 the charcoal counts in uh, in in the um, in the sections that we sampled. And there is also a, 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 a large increase in herbs. And herbs stay uh, dominant, stay present in the area until uh, this, this carpenters phase, when archaeology also phases out. And we have something like 2,000 years of hominin presence in the site, represented by these uh, pollen assemblage zones. And, and here are the main find levels indicated in the... Um, on the, on the, on the right-hand side. Um, and it is only when archaeology is, becomes very marginal that uh, the pollen indicates that uh, the, the area becomes forested again with a closed canopy forest. Before that time period, um, herbs dominate from the arrival of hominins onward. So for whatever reason, um, there's a period of vegetation openness around this lake, and it also applies to Neumar Nord 1, from the moment that hominins move in until the moment that their arche the archaeological traces become very, very ephemeral. We, of course, don't know what is cause and what is effect. We don't know whether they moved in because the landscape opened for natural fires or whether, whether hominins played a role in, in, in opening up the landscape, you can only see that there's a correlation between their presence and open vegetation. That does not mean that that humans were the cause. That is why there was this question mark in my title. That question mark in the title, uh, we were not able to put that question mark in the science advances paper in which we published this material because the, the journal didn't allow us to use a question mark in the title. Um, but that's the, that's the, so this is the basic thing. We have a massive hominin presence for 2,000 years, not only in uh, um, in Normark North 2, but also in Normark North 1. That hominin presence starts with a big charcoal spike, the la and the landscape stays open till uh, till stays open till hominins become a very um, minor factor in the landscape. This is um, first. This no. I'll get back to this. This is these are pollen percentages, and pollen percentages uh, need to be corrected. I'll get back to that uh, in in a minute, because um, because there are biases in these pollen percentages. Some, depending on the taxon, uh, taxons um, different taxa produce different amounts of pollen. Uh, the, the pollen productivity of, of, of taxons varies, and there is also a different dispersal behavior between different taxons, and that needs to be corrected. And there is a landscape reconstruction algorithm that does that. Uh, and if you apply that to this site, to this pollen diagram, to these pollen percentages, and to the ones from Neumark North and, and others, the landscape becomes even more open, according to the work that's going on now by uh, Oda Neu, that's this. Oops. There were there were no trees within three four hundred meters from from both Neumark North One and Neumark North Two. That was completely open. 
com completely open landscape. Um, and, and we have to realize that, um, um, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm mixing my story up by, by, by playing around with these slides. On the, on the top right, you see Neumann North again. Forget about the, the, the diagram. That's it. On, on the lower left, you see the Neumark North One Lake, we indicated where uh, Mania excavated uh, skeletons of uh, uh, complete and partial skeletons of, of, of all kinds of animals. And the grayish areas, so these areas are areas that have um, of, of high artifact and bone density. So what we are what we excavated at Neumark North Two is probably just one part of a giant scatter of uh, of high density uh, lithic and and bone and charcoal uh, remains so just to indicate that what we are seeing here this this massive human presence over a period of 2000 years well documented in high resolution here uh, probably also uh, was the case here at this uh, around this much larger lake but despite the high resolution we cannot say for certain that that the changes in vegetation were caused by hominins. We can only say that they correspond in time with the presence of hominins. And in order to get a bit more grip on this on this question, um, we also looked at other sites in this uh, in, in this area. Uh, in what is called the, the Mitteldeutsche Strockengebiet in, in a pretty arid Area and the rain shadow of the Hartz Mountains, because there are many there are many processes that can uh, uh, make vegetation open. Uh, you have you have herbivores. There are uh, uh, um, changes in water level. If you have if you have very shallow shores, uh, a tiny change in water level creates a lot of open space around uh, around the lake, which can be colonized by herbs, etc. So you have to deal with all these. Uh, all these factors, and this is, what, this is what we did by looking at other lakes in the area, for instance, the sites of Gröbern and, and Grabschutz, where you have a comparable morphology of the lakes so with, with lake shores or, or, or that are as steep or as shallow as the ones from Neumark North 1 and 2, where you have comparable animals roaming around, as we know from small amounts of uh, uh, um, Animal remains recovered from those sites, also in lignite quarries. Uh, we're, so we're profiting from this, from the presence of these lignite uh, mines in that area in Germany. And what you basically see in terms of very simple pollen percentages, so uh, independent of later or ongoing landscape reconstruction algorithm work, is that at Gröbern and Grabschutz in the, 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 the time period in which uh, you have these uh, herbs dominating Neumann Nord 2 and Neumann Nord 1. Herbs are almost absent, are very, 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 very minimal, vin minimally represented. By the way, if you have questions along the way, uh, shoot. Uh, I forgot to mention at the beginning. So we published, we published those findings in a paper a, a few years ago, as I mentioned, without the possibility to add a question mark here in the in the title but all the let's say the lines of reasoning and the details you can read at ease in this paper much better than what i have just presented um but i wanted to wanted to emphasize that neumark north that the case of neumark north might not be the only site where you see this uh, correlation or correspondence between a strong human presence and a landscape that opens up or that, that stays open during uh, human presence. For instance, the, there's a site at about 50 kilometers southeast of uh, Neumark, Rabutz, again, a quarry site, where pollen are only pr present for the, for the period after human presence, and uh, where the, the field work took place already in the early 1900s, so a very, very long time ago. But also in Rabutz, which has been studied in great detail by uh, German uh, paleobotanists and archaeologists, there were, there were excavations before the, the First World War, well-documented excavations, well-curated by the people in the Halle Museum, because many of, 
a lot of this work, I'm going to show you a few more examples. A lot of the work that we are doing, we can only do because there's this beautiful museum infrastructure in Eastern Germany uh, that's also that's all that also afforded possibilities for the recent Ranis publication. Also, it's from the same museum. It's from the uh, from the Halle Museum who take care of their goodies or baddies uh, in a in a in a very in a in a applaudable way. Uh, so this is Rabut's uh, excavation with a lot of uh, lithic material and also faunal remains. And there too, um, the, the a report from, what is it, 1920, 1921, again emphasizes, and of course this is, I'm, I'm not saying that this has the same quality as the Neumark Nord uh, uh, evidence has, not the same resolution, but it shows that at Rabut's, the around the lake where these smashed bones with beautiful cut marks and the um the 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 flint artifacts are associated with big pieces of charcoal and, and a lot of uh, smaller charcoal um is associated with a, a period of open vegetation which which ends when the archaeology disappears for whatever reasons but there's a strong correspondence which in 1920 already um, was interpreted by this this uh, paleobotanist Weber as uh, the result of uh, uh, regular grass fires uh, lighted by the uh, the, the wilden by the by the by, by the hunters uh, in intentionally kept the forest away in a time period when climatic conditions would have uh, um, would have facilitated the development of forests. This is this is just a wild hypothesis of Weber almost 20, almost more than a century ago. But it goes to show that the Neumark North 1 and 2 might not be the only locations where this where this correlation exists. Whatever the correlation means, that's uh, step two. So from the vegetation to the to the from the flora to the fauna, just a few words on on ongoing work. This is a picture of uh, uh, the excavation of Neumark Nord II, um, where we are working through the through this through this infill of the lake and especially in the shore area of the lake. And this is a badly preserved tusk of a of a forest elephant. Um, and that links that's that's together with a they, uh, that's the only find of an elephant from the from uh, from the Neumann or two excavation and that links us to the excavations of mania in that in that larger Neumann North one uh, lake because when mania was uh, uh, working in this area rescue his rescue excavations um, gathered the remains so something like like three thousand five hundred remains of forest elephants, and many of the of the forest elephants encountered by the digging machine by the quarrying machines could not be salvaged. They were just written down as skeleton disappeared or skeleton uh, etc. But what what he did observe is that um, there were concentrations of tusks. So in these fine grain deposits. Uh, I think in one case he had something like nine tusks from an area of four by five meters, and uh, on some of the elephants tusks had been taken away, for whatever reason. Or, but in th this type of sedimentary environment, we're talking about very fine grained silts and loams. It is very difficult to imagine that this was the result of uh, of, of sedimentary processes. Anyway, this is just the tusk from Neumark Nord 2 that I've shown you is just the intro to the uh, to the tusk from Neumark Nord 1. Because Mania, as I already mentioned, the amount of uh, elephant remains recovered from uh, from the site Neumark Nord 1, it's humongous. And the, the material had been studied by uh, an Italian team, Rita Palombo and, and colleagues, who did a beautiful job uh, um, studying the the ontogeny of these elephants studying the uh, assigning sex to uh, to skeletal remains uh, assigning age etc and and that was all wrapped up in a, in an in an, in an exhibition in 2010 in Halle 
for which Mania and his team produced a beautiful book with um, coming up with all the with, with details, not only about the elephants, but ab about the archaeology and the paleontology of all creatures, plant, uh, animal, from, from small to, to these elephant remains. The elephants from Neumark North, as studied by uh, Rita Palombo and, and Lara Mendi, they were huge. They were they they they, they identified a very strong uh, difference between the sexes, uh, with with males reaching shoulder heights of up to four meters, and and uh, weights of between from eight to uh, thirteen tons. So twice as large as African uh, savanna elephants, and me, uh, females were a bit, a bit smaller. I think from four to eight tons or something like that. Um, these the the elephants' remains were also stored in in Halle, and as you can imagine, if you have uh, remains of seventy elephants and fifty, of which fifty two or fifty three are more or less complete, you need a lot of 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 space to do that. Um, and Sabine Godzinski Windhauser, who was a zooarchaeologist, um, had the idea to look at these bones from a zooarchaeological perspective. So beyond the paleontological perspective that had already been published in great and admirable detail by the Italians. And when she started to look at the at, at started looking at the bones, she immediately was hit by the fact that almost every bone had beautiful cut marks of the, these elephant bones. So it's it it was a it yes yeah, she she did most of the work assisted by uh, Lutz Kindler and I was the roadie I uh, moved some of these boxes and uh, also made some of the pictures etc etc cetera, et cetera. but she did most of the work and it, it it took her almost a year to go through all the material and scanning in first instance roughly scanning the uh, the bones for cut marks and then. Uh, uh, documenting the bones, documenting the cut marks. This is from a heel bone. And then finally, uh, um, making these pictures and, and, and indicating where the cut marks were present on the, on, on, on the uh, bones of the individual animals and then combining it into these, these types of pictures where specific cut marks are linked to specific body parts. This has been published in Science Advances too last year. So um, for the details, you can go to that uh, to that paper. But the interesting thing from Neum from Neumark Nord, and that relates to the impact that humans hominins may have had in those types of environments, is that um, the cut mark distribution pattern shows primary access to fresh carcasses. Um, the distribution of the cut marks indicates that they were going for the, or also were taking the flesh. From the long bones, if the carcasses had been ripening, then you wouldn't expect uh, cut marks on the long bones. Um, the processing was more or less the same for a period of two of the two thousand years that hominins were present in that area, and it and it was and that was Palombo's work. The animals were dominated by uh, males and by old males, so a profile that does not indicate uh, a natural mortality profile, as already was suggested by Rita Palombo and colleagues. And this suggests targeting of adult males, which are uh, easier to target in the sense that they are usually operating on their own. They don't have the eyes and ears of, of females watching out for the, for the, for the small ones, etc. So that is also in the ethnographic record uh, an easier target, no matter how dangerous it still is, than um, than 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 females who don't tend to operate on their own. We have no clue how they uh, targeted these animals. Ethnographic works suggest that immob immobilizing these animals in the in 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 swamp or whatever, what was which was around a lot in the uh, um, in the lake environment. May have may have played a role, but we basically simply don't know. Gary Larson has also speculated on the. Um, this is for the arrow. That is, we don't know how um, how they uh, 
how they brought him down, but they did. And that has that that targeting of adult males um, suggests that, and the and the extensive exploitation of these males left us puzzling because the the type of cut marks, this, the the cut mark distribution. Uh, suggests that they had huge amounts of proteins and fat to deal with because of this extended utilization. Huge amounts of uh, of uh, of food. And we estimated that a 10 metric ton individuals, and that's, let's say, an average male in, in Neumark Nord, would have yielded um, as a, a protein poisoning safe um, uh, uh, amount of 2,500 daily portions of 4,000 kilocalories. That's a, it's an enormous amount of food. And we're not talking about one animal, we're talking about dozens of animals that were exploited in such a way. All in terms of this extended utilization, that's a term that has been coined by Gary Haynes for a specific type of uh, uh, butchering of elephants, which is which is represented in a classical way at Neumann North. And that, of course, has views for our, has implications for how we think about local group size and food storage, et cetera. But again, there's a lot possible, but there's very, very, very little observable, apart from the fact that they were doing this at this location. So this was published in Science Advances a few uh, uh, last year. And after, um, after having uh, done this Norma Not study, we also started to look at other elephant sites because uh, as, assuming that, or in order to test whether this was something that was just uh, determined by the local circumstances of this lake, of this Norma Not Lake environment, we tried to find other um, elephant assemblages and one of the ones that are around and also preserved in, in, in Halle, is this elephant uh, recovered in front of these huge quarrying machines in 1987, also in the lignite uh, quarry in Gröben. This is a plan within red, the, the lithic uh, artifacts that were uh, laying around this, uh, this elephant. And they, uh, again, very nicely stored in Halle. Uh, they, we, we couldn't have done this without the museum folks there. And, and and there again you 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 get uh, um, you get the exploitation of a an adult male around forty years old, so a pretty old uh, elephant uh, butchered in comparable in in a way comparable to the one from uh, Neumark North. And, and another site that we revisited is is a very old site, the site of Taubach near uh, uh, Weimar. That's a site uh, where a travertine sequence is on top of a very uh, thin layer, 40 centimeters of uh, travertine sands. And already in the 1870s, flint artifacts were found in this, uh, in this small scale quarry together with the remains of more than 60 elephants, uh, hominins, um, bears, uh, rhinos, some of you may remember that uh, there was a Bruder Bratlund did a study of the uh, of, of the rhinos from Taubach, in which he, uh, I think it was some an MNI of something like 1890, in which he established that uh, the rhinos covered in cut marks. Uh, the rhino assemblage here was biased in favor of pretty young individuals. Anyway, it's a nice study by Bruder Bratlund around 2000 we had a look at the at the elephants coming from this uh, from this site from this location the problem was that an early excavation focused on the goodies so the the teeth etc uh, and what was still left of that uh, material because it tobach was a very famous site at the end of the 19th century and its material became distributed over all natural history museums you can imagine i guess vienna also has a few, uh, at least Leiden, the Naturalis Museum has 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 uh, a lot from Taubach. It was exchanged between uh, the Weimar Museum and uh, uh, other museum. And again, 
in Weimar, there's this Wolfgang Zirgel house that, uh, again, thanks to the curators of the museum, that still has some material from from um, from from Taubach. Taubach is very close to uh, to Weimar, and in that, um, it's 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 not a rich collection, but it's the best collection, the most provenance collection uh, around. And again, in that in that area, in that assemblage, we were also able to find comparable pat patterns comparable to the one from 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 Neumark North. Although, given the small number of uh, finds and and uh, at Gröben it's only one skeleton, we can't say anything about selection in favor of uh, of adult males or whatever. So we we don't have a pattern that is as strong as um, as Neumark North, but elephant exploitation was was uh, part of the behavioral repertoire of these last interglacial Neanderthals. Yeah, and at the moment, in order to, so 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 what I want to say is, um, we we have we we see an, uh, a possible impact of Neanderthals on uh, interglacial vegetation, cr creating this uh, um, this possibly creating this vegetation openness as documented at Neumark North, for whatever reasons we can we can talk about that we can discuss that, and um, we see an impact in terms of bone remains on uh, local uh, faunal communities, including the biggest ones, the uh, elephants. Uh, and then of course, at the, uh, the, the the small side I mentioned at Normark North too, with these, uh, with these dozens of uh, cervids, equids, and bovids. Um, that's also indicative of, 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 of um, what was going on around those lakes. But at the moment, uh, colleagues from the, uh, the MPIC in uh, uh, Mainz, so the Max Planck Institute for Chemistry from the, from the University of Mainz, and uh, colleague and Michi Hofreiter and co collaborators from the Max Planck in Leipzig are working on, the, on uh, isotopes and on uh, DNA from all these prey animals. At the moment, um, there is something, there is uh, uh, a wide range of isotopes from 150 uh, <laughs> individuals coming from both Normark Nord 1 and Normark Nord 2. So it's it's the whole lot. It's uh, uh, it's the uh, most of it is uh, sequential sampling of teeth. Uh, we have uh, uh, carbon, calcium, uh, nitrogen, oxygen, strontium, iron, manganese, and barium. That's most of that is done by uh, uh, what's his name, uh, Theo Takai and Jennifer Leichlitter. Um, and the DNA also looks very promising uh, from the same. Aliquots, there is also uh, uh, DNA DNA uh, material, and we have good hopes of reconstructing a few complete genomes, including from the elephants. It's all it's it's all pretty well preserved, and we hope that these uh, isotope studies will inform us on uh, uh, changes in uh, feeding ecology, possibly migration. There are a few outliers in terms of strontium, and the strontium is according to Leichlitter and Takai, certainly biogenic. Um, so we will probably be able to see changes through time because at Neumark Nord 2, we have this, we have the whole last interglacial sampled by uh, uh, by plant remains, by faunal remains, and also at least for the first half of the, of the last interglacial by uh, massive uh, human activities. And we hope that in due time, this will allow us to piece together uh, all these different lines of of information about uh, possible human impact on on the environment there so to wrap up we have this high resolution data set on the last interglacial ecosystem with which will allow us to say more about uh, uh, the human impact on that ecosystem and that high resolution data set, which you basically need to say anything about, uh, to differentiate between anthropogenic and non-anthropogenic uh, processes, that's a result from a unique combination of geomorphological processes. I think it, it cannot be overemphasized that 
uh, this is from a recent paper, um, most of the last interglacial pollen sequences from Europe, pollen sequences for the complete interglacial, are from this tiny stretch, well, tiny, it's not tiny, but they are from this very specific part of Europe, which is the, the spatial distribution of the Sali and the MIS 6 glaciers, which has bulldozed the landscape completely. And when it retreated, the glaciers retreated, there were all these uh, sediment traps, these ac ac accommodating space that allowed, uh, that allowed uh, sedimentation and trapping the, 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 the proxies of the of, of the subsequent interglacial, even here in the in, in the UK. So and and the, the the tiny area that I discussed also profited from the fact that the, the subsequent uh, glacial, the Vaxelian, never reached this area. So it didn't destroy the sediment traps that were uh, generated by the preceding glaciation. And we know from work that we did in Neumark that there are more of these uh, basins around still buried in the underground, covered by 10 meters of loss present in, in the in the current area where this where the, where the lake is now. So around around the lake there are more of these basins present, which can be sampled by augering or even by excavations in the future. So that's one thing, it's the, it's the, the geological processes. And then it's political history so there are these all these filters that determine or 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 distribution maps. The political history, the German Democratic Republic became cut off from the carboniferous coal uh, reserves when the wall came up. So they started in the GDR times in the DDR, they started to 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 make these to to dig all these uh, lignite quarries on a scale that was unprecedented. They had to. To create their own to become energy independent, and then so you that led to this large scale landscape destruction, which allows us archaeologists because we are vultures, we are dependent on uh, on landscape destruction to some degree, and it's I mean it's it's discovery through destruction. Um, the Neumark North is is a classic example of landscape destruction and discovery through destruction. And we all also have had a few, a year ago, we had a whole debate in Leiden about archeologists being involved and uh, complicit in landscape destruction. But that's, that's, that's another topic, but it, but it is. And then of course you need the presence of a group of dedicated archeologists like Dietrich Mania and earth scientists and an excellent museum structure that allows you to uh, to create these high resolution data sets. So th these are all filters that uh, come into play when you uh, when you look at such a small at these small publications. All these processes are uh, uh, germane to what we can or cannot say. And of course, we need a lot of people. We had more than two hundred student excavators at Neumark North. Mario Lane was one of them. Uh, and then all these other colleagues who are still uh, uh, who did work or are still working on the project. Thank you.